I cannot wait for this week's topic. Jesus and politics. Ooh. Gonna be fun. Very exciting. Jesus was clearly a Republican. Uh, I don't think so. Well, that's what my friends are telling me anyway. Yeah, but that doesn't mean anything. Are they uninformed? Yes. They're out, out to lunch? Yes. He was a Democrat? No. Well, what was he? Independent. Independently what? Independently godly. Ah. Howdy, West Side. I'm having a little too much fun in this cow tipping series. Kind of feels right at home to me. I am thrilled that you're here. I'm a fan of country music. The old country twang twang stuff doesn't do much for me, but the young country's kind of got an interesting way of taking the practical stuff of life and putting it in humorous ways. A friend of mine this past week sent me the 100 worst song titles in country music. Wow, there are some doozies in here. Since we're kind of doing a Western theme and cow tipping and stuff, I thought I'd just share a few of these with you. Are you ready for them? First couple of them actually have some spiritual overtones. Drop kick me Jesus through the goalpost of life. <laughs> Can't you just hear that? Drop kick me Jesus through the goalpost of life. I, mean, I think that'd be a pretty good song, yeah. Uh, another one that's kind of got spiritual overtones. I've been roped and thrown by Jesus in the Holy Ghost Corral. <laughs> I am not making these up, folks. These are actual country songs. And then they turn a little bit more to the woe is me side of country. I kind of like this one. How can I miss you if you won't go away? <laughs> that works, you know. I like this one. I would have writ you a letter, but I couldn't spell yuck. <laughs> It's not bad. I'm just a bug on the windshield of life. Ever felt like that? Some days you're the bug, and some days you're the windshield. Uh, I love this one too. And now it really turns more to the to the uh, the romantic piece of country music. If you don't leave me alone, I'll go and find someone else who will. Some of y'all are going to get that halfway through lunch. If you leave me, can I come too? I love that. She made toothpicks out of the timber of my heart. And maybe the most practical one in the group, Mama, get the hammer. There's a fly on Daddy's head. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Here's the last one. I saved it for, for the best for last. Get your biscuits in the oven and your buns in the bed. <laughs> Only in country music can you get away with that kind of stuff. Well, let's tip some cows today. You ready to do that? Grab your notes. We want to jump right in. Here's the big idea for this series. Write it down. Jesus expects us, he expects us to examine our beliefs in the light of Scripture. We all have sacred cows. What's a sacred cow? It's a belief you have that may not add up to what God says. Maybe you got it from grandma and grandpa. Maybe you got it from mom and dad. Maybe you got it from some experience in life. Maybe you got it just because you've thought things through, and this is what you believe. Sincerity does not make a belief true. I've met people who sincerely believe they are good-looking and they are ugly. It doesn't help. I've met people who sincerely believe they're intelligent, and they're not. It doesn't help. And I've met people who sincerely believe they're close to God, and they're not necessarily close to God. We've got to take the belief and hold it up in the light of Scripture. And if it's a sacred cow, we learned last week, what do we do with sacred cows? You shoot them. You get rid of them. You make hamburger out of them. They make great burgers. Last week, we talked about this idea. That some of us believe that Jesus picked us, saved us, and keeps us, and that's all there is. It's the Christians in a pickle jar approach to life. I've been chosen, I've been saved, I'll be kept, that's all. No, the Scripture says that that's the first half. The second half is Jesus also calls us and sends us and uses us. We hold up that sacred cow to the light of Scripture. Here's our base passage for this entire series. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to make us realize what is wrong in our lives, to teach us what is true. Look at the second part. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to observe what is right. Now look this way, church. When you come week after week after week, there are some weeks you ought to leave feeling corrected. 
Because when we look at the Scripture, we go, oh, I don't have that right in my life. Oh, I need to fix that habit. I need to submit that attitude. I need to surrender that part of who I am. Scripture will correct us. It makes us realize what is wrong, it says. But the second part is it also teaches us to do what is right. There ought to be some weeks you leave here going, I can do that. Yeah, I can follow Christ that way. I can learn that. I can apply that. There's no such thing as an intersection or an encounter with the God of this Scripture that doesn't change us either by correction or by encouragement or by both. We hold up our beliefs against the light of Scripture. Here's today's sacred cow. It's going to be fun. Are you ready? When it comes to politics, Jesus is a member of the last blank is party. What do you think the first blank is? When it comes to politics, Jesus is a member of, I can already see the wheels turning. Some of you are going, he is clearly Republican. He's clearly Republican. I mean, the Republicans lean to the right. They've got a lot of, of, of let's go back to God in their message. and They're big on the morality stuff. And Jesus is clearly a Republican. And the other people in the room going, you got to be kidding me. Never met a Republican with a heart. Jesus is clearly a Democrat. He cares about the hurting and the homeless and the helpless. He is clearly the champion of the underdog. And there are some of you going in this great state of Kansas. you got to be kidding. He's independent. He's on his own. Here's the sacred cow. Are you ready? It's going to get personal. Many of us simply believe that Jesus is a member of my political party. We've just decided Jesus is on our side. And instead of joining him, we have managed to make him join us. This is called let's stuff Jesus in the small box of a political platform. Here's the problem, guys. You ready? He don't fit. Bad English, exactly what I intended to say. I'm amazed at how when every presidential election comes around, all the candidates start going to church. All the candidates work God. They may not have talked about God for the 12 years before. You can listen to their speeches. You can search it out. But man, God gets to be the spiritual additive of their life at that moment. And it's like they're trying to use Jesus to work into their political platform. He doesn't fit. The cow is, Jesus is a member of my political party. He endorses my stand. Here's the truth of Scripture. Jesus' purpose is higher than politics. Much, much higher than politics. Let's have a little fun. We can never understand what God is saying to us in the 21st century if we don't get a hold of the context of what Jesus said in the first century setting. So into what arena, into what political circumstance is Jesus teaching us? There were three political parties in Jesus' day. And when I describe them, you're going to be amazed at how little politics has changed in 21 centuries. You ready? The first political party were the Pharisees. Now, before we get real down on those guys, they did some fairly good things. The Pharisees were the party of religious and cultural purity. They were the preservers of traditional values. They were the let's take this place back to God party. Let's go back to a better, more moral day party. They were clearly, write it in your notes, the conservatives of Jesus' day. Clearly, the conservatives of Jesus' day. They were rule keepers. They had litmus tests. You have to believe these three things to be part of us. They were hard on everyone, particularly hard on Jesus, because they would push their point of view. They said to Jesus, why are you baptizing? Who gave you that authority? Why are you teaching? Who said you could do that? Why are you healing on the Sabbath? How dare you break our rules? They were the political right party, way to the right of Jesus' day. Second party of Jesus' day, the Sadducees. Here's the cool part of this party. Their emphasis was on the here and now. 
In fact, they believed there was no such thing as an afterlife. There was only this life. Now, if there's only this life, we better do some good while we have it. Because since we don't live eternally, the only thing that lives after us is our influence. They were clearly the liberal party of Jesus' day. And things haven't changed much. Check this out. They love to ask ridiculous questions. When the conservative Pharisee would raise a point, the liberal Sadducee would simply look for a small exception and then say, well, since you can't answer the exception, I could ignore everything you've said. They were the original folks who answered questions with questions. Has today's politician learned that one well? You ask them what they believe, and they ask you something else. It is an amazing departure. They literally were the liberal party of Jesus' day, and they raised good to be more important than God. Don't miss that. Good was more important than God. Doing good, taking care of the homeless, taking care of the helpless, doing the stuff that made you look morally good was more important than an encounter with God himself. Pharisees, the conservatives, Sadducees, the liberals. I love this. Politics really hadn't changed much. There was a third independent party. They were called the Zealots. I'm a little bit drawn to these guys. The Zealots were crusaders. They were rebels looking for a cause. They wanted to overthrow everything. If somebody was in charge, their goal was to overthrow it. They were always armed. These guys were the original conceal and carry folks. They carried large knives or even short swords under their outer garments. They were looking for a fight and ready for a fight and never ran from a fight. And check this out. One of Jesus' 12 disciples is nicknamed Simon the Zealot. Translate it Simon the Knife Carrier. Simon the Protector. The tea party started a long time ago, guys. <laughs> Do you hear that? This idea of let's overthrow it, let's change it, let's be radical. We have always had. Since the time of Jesus, a right-leaning political party, a left-leaning political party, and a I don't like either one of you guys political party. There's not much that has changed in 21 years of politics. Why? Because politics is about the nature of man, and the nature of man never totally changes, except for a supernatural encounter with Jesus Christ. So here's the point I want to make. Write it in. It's big. Jesus endorsed none of these parties. None. The Pharisees came and asked him questions, hoping he'd support them. The Sadducees came and asked him questions, hoping he'd support them. The Zealots stood by just ready for a battle, hoping Jesus was going to overthrow the government, and he never endorsed any of them. Why? Why did Jesus not endorse one of these political parties? Why did he not get involved in politics? We've already said it, but write it in your notes again. He had a higher purpose. He had a higher purpose. Folks, don't miss this. If politics could change the world, God would have sent a politician. But because we needed a Savior, that's who he sent. Politics matter? You bet. Salvation matter more? I don't know. What do you think? Trying to manage pagan man, which is what politics is about, or trying to help people come to Christ and have a supernatural encounter and be changed, which is what salvation is about. Jesus wouldn't stoop to get involved in politics because it was a departure from his higher purpose. Now, what was the higher purpose? We see it in two places in Scripture. First, he was building a different kingdom. He was building a different kingdom. You're aware that the reason that the Jews of Jesus' day and the reason many Jews still today reject Jesus as the Messiah is they were looking for a political, military savior. 
They wanted somebody to come in and conquer Rome and throw the political shackles off of them and free their country. And when Jesus came announcing freedom, not for the country, but for the souls of men and women, they missed it altogether. I'd suggest to you that even today, Jesus is less interested in overthrowing the politics of a country and more interested in the individual salvation of the people of that country. Does that make sense? He has a higher kingdom. How did he say it? His disciples were talking to him one day. They were basically saying, Jesus, what's going on? You're going to be king? You're going to overthrow things? You're going to take charge? What's happening? And his response, literally, several times in Scripture, this thought, my kingdom is not of this world. That's what he actually said on the day of his trial. Are you going to be a king? Are you the king of the Jews? My kingdom is not of this world world. The second part of it, though, is even more pointed. Jesus did not get involved in politics because he was focused on regeneration. Now, I've already defined it for you in your notes, on saving souls. On saving souls. Think about this. If Jesus had said, yep, I'm a Pharisee, I think they've got it figured out, I'm supporting the Pharisee's party, he'd have lost the other two parties that quick. If Jesus announced today, I'm a Republican, he'd never win another Democrat to himself. He has a higher purpose. It is so funny to me that all the parties and all the candidates claim God is in their party. Folks, he's not partying with any of them. He's got a higher party, a higher concern, a higher responsibility. Does that mean we should not be involved in politics? Absolutely not. We need Christ followers at every level of the political process. But we don't need a Christ follower who thinks they've got Jesus stuffed in their Republican box or stuffed in their Democratic box or stuffed in their independent box. We do need God in politics. But we need to understand that he has a higher purpose. It was interesting to me last week that when the governor of Texas, a state I pay a little attention to, had a nationwide prayer rally and 25,000 people came to pray for our country, that all the folks on the other political point of views started blasting him for bringing God into politics. Listen close, church. Do we believe in the separation of church and state? Yes. The government should never make religious rules. They ought to be separated. But do we believe that God is needed more in American politics right now than he's ever been? I do. I do. I'm looking for a politician who's going after the heart of God. I'm looking for somebody who's not afraid to call a prayer rally. I'm looking for somebody that's actually been going after Jesus for a lifetime instead of just the last few months because they're campaigning. We don't get back to a heart for God. Wow. Where do we go? Somebody asked me not long ago, is Jesus a conservative or a liberal? Here's my answer. You ready? He's conservative in theology. He's moderate in his habits, and he's liberal in his love. He doesn't fit our labels. He doesn't fit our political party. Still loves us, just doesn't fit. Turn to your neighbor and say, I love you despite your political incorrectness. Tell them. <laughs> love you despite it. God does too. So here's the question. Would Jesus endorse a political party today? Follow this reasoning. Scripture says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did he endorse a party when he was here walking around on the earth in the body? He did not. Is he endorsing one today? He is not. He's not. He's got a higher purpose than politics. Well, what do we do with that? What do we do with that? What are our civil responsibilities as Christ followers? 
This is where I want us to spend our time today, and then we're going to apply one of these before we leave. First, God would have us to recognize the authority of governments. The Scripture says, Paul writes, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Everybody look this way. It doesn't matter if you like the guy in Washington right now that's the president or not. He's been placed there by God. That verse says, all authority is from God, and all those in a position of authority have been put there by God. God has allowed this person. He has put this person. He is working in and through this. Do I understand what I just said to you? No! <laughs> Good grief, no! I don't have to. God says, I'm doing this. God says, I'm in this, and he expects us to submit. Now, I'm just going to quit teaching for a minute and go to preaching for a second, okay? I'm about done with Christ followers who think their number one pastime is criticizing government leaders. That's not submission. If you're one of the folks sending me all of the political jokes, taking shots at all our government leaders, do me a favor, stop. I don't laugh, I don't read them, I delete them. Because I'm trying to keep my attitude as one of submission and support. And it's pretty hard for me right now. Okay? It's pretty hard for me right now. So I don't need any help making it harder. And I want to suggest that we, as Christ followers, have a responsibility to support and to submit to that authority. But secondly, and we'll preach even harder here, it's time for us to pray for the leaders of our government. Notice what Paul wrote to young Timothy, young follower in Christ. He said, I urge then that first of all, petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And then notice what he inserts. Notice what he stops. For kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. Now, there are several reasons in that verse to pray for our government leaders. Number one, we're commanded to. Number two, it pleases God. Number three, it allows us to live quiet and peaceful lives. Anybody interested in any of those? I am. And yet, I find more American Christ followers spend most of their time on government issues criticizing their government rather than praying for it. If we would spend half as much time being critical and twice as much time praying, Washington would change. And folks, we need her to change. I don't know anybody anywhere in the political spectrum of America right now that thinks we're doing well. Do you? Economically, we're in trouble. Spiritually, ridiculously bad. It's time to pray. Here's a hint. You don't have to like somebody to pray for them. Aren't you glad? Seriously, aren't you glad? In your marriage relationships, many of you have been through stretches where your husband is driving you nuts. Ladies, let's be honest. Some of you have prayed, God, change him before I kill him. You've prayed that. And guys, there have been moments where you've said, Lord, you gave me this woman. You fix her. Now would be good. In that marriage relationship, do you find that criticism of your mate works best or prayer for your mate works best? Which one? And especially do you find that criticizing your mate, not to her face, but to anyone who will listen, that's the best plan? Or is the best plan to get anybody who will join you to pray? It's become the political pastime of America to criticize our political leaders. And it saddens me to see Christ followers being sucked into that pit. Be wiser than that, church. 
Let's be wiser than that. God says you submit and you pray. We're going to do something right now that some of us have never done. We're going to pray for our president. We're going to pray for him. Personally, I think he needs a lot of prayer. I want to see his heart move toward God. I want to see our country move toward God. I want to see him surrounded by godly, wise leaders. And the only way I know to impact that is not by criticizing him to every friend I've got, but by praying for him at every opportunity that I get. So we're going to wrap up today by praying for our government leaders. Would you join me in that prayer? Jesus, in all the years of my life, I've never been this concerned for our country. We are economically wrecked, Lord. We have forfeited the position of the strongest economic nation in the world. We are morally bankrupt. We have forfeited our position, Lord, as the leader of morality in this world. And God, it just feels like politically we're just adrift. And Jesus, I know that you use all those in authority in government. I know that you ordain it. I know that we must support it, and we do. But you also tell us to pray, Lord, and that implies that change is possible, that prayer is necessary, that you want us to beseech you. So right now, Jesus, we lift the President of the United States to you. Lord, it doesn't matter if we voted for him or not. He's our president. I cannot imagine the burden he carries. I cannot even conceive the pressure he's under. And Lord, I think he's probably at the I can't do this alone place. I pray he turns to you. Surround him with counselors. Men and women with spiritual depth, with wisdom to speak into his life. God, let him listen for your word. I pray today, Lord, for our country. Return us to you. Forgive me, Lord, for spending more time being critical than I've spent in prayer. In Christ, we ask these things.